All right. <laughs> I did my grade school in Sri Lanka, in South Asia, a little island. I completed my middle school and high school in India. For those who do not know, Asian parents are very particular about their children's education. <laughs> they are very concerned. They will do anything and everything to give a good education for their children. In fact, your success in those countries, at least in those days when I was young, was decided by the profession that you are going to get. Fortunately, my mother was not a tiger mom. My father was not a tiger dad. They allowed me to do whatever I wanted to do. But there was a social pressure, an invisible pressure that holds you down. You got to decide who you want to be when you grow up. And this decision is made very early in your life, when you are in fifth standard or sixth standard. Very early, you are 10 years old, and you got to make a decision who you want to be. And there were three choices given to me by the society at large, not my parents. And the first choice is, you be a doctor. No wonder 20% of the doctors in this country are Asians, <laughs> although they constitute less than 5% of the population. The second choice was, become an engineer. 50% of the engineers in Silicon Valley are from Asia. And the third choice is a failure. So, three good choices. <laughs> Doctor, engineer, failure. <laughs> what do I do? And I was 10 years old. Now, I always thought doctors deal with blood, and I wasn't sure if that's something I can handle. In fact, I fainted at the sight of blood. So that's not for me. And that's the most lucrative and preferred desirable profession. So I lost that one right away. And nobody wants to be a failure by choice. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, OK, I got to be an engineer. So I decided to become an engineer because that was the only choice I had. Now, don't get me wrong. I had a lot of fun in my school. I had great teachers. But my path was set. You got to be an engineer. That means I was like a horse with blinkers on with limited vision. This is the direction you go from your grade school to be an engineer. Now, that was a journey I started. Looking back, you know, I did pretty well, pretty good. I enjoyed what I did. But if I look back and think about learning, how was that experience? It was more like preparing for an exam all your life. Every single day you go to school, prepare for something that is unknown that you got to pass. It is like teaching to the test. Now, that kind of a feeling was very difficult, but we all handled very well. It was like, you know, uh, the correct word would be, I, I put in my time. You know, It's like a petty criminal going to prison coming back and saying, I did my, I paid my dues. It was like I paid my dues in high school, and I went on to become an engineer. And in fact, after being an engineer for a few years, I wanted to be a professor because I thought that's more fun in teaching. So I went to graduate school, meaning I put in, I paid more dues now. <laughs> the point is, more and more we did this, what is the difference between teaching and learning? What did I learn at the end of the day? That was the question I had. So here I am an engineer and an educator. Now, as an engineer, I am very practical. You all know engineers are very result-oriented people. They focus on results. They don't care about emotions. They base their ideas on facts. In fact, we develop precise definitions and, and rules. And that's one reason I never argue with my wife, because there are no rules. <laughs> you can't win. All right? So for me to talk about education is very difficult, because 
I have never seen a precise definition for education. Everybody seems to have a definition for education. But good thing about education is everybody wants education. I do not know of anyone who says, I don't want education. In fact, parents want education for their children. Poor parents want education for their children. Rich parents want education for their children. All parents want education. Middle class parents want education for their children. And the best thing is children also want to have education for themselves. So everybody wants education. But what is it? What is education? Do we love education for students? As far as students are concerned, education is all about studying. Go to school, study. Go to school, study. Studying is education. Very recently someone told me studying really means students dying, studying. <laughs> so, so if you are not enjoying education, if education is not an enjoyable activity, why do everybody want education? Well, I thought about it, and the only thing I could come up with is education gives you hope. Hope to get a better job. Hope to change your social status. Hope to acquire some new skills. Hope to meet new people. Hope to make your parents proud and happy. Hope to learn some, something new, something that will make you happy. But are our students really learning something new, something happy, something that will make them content? That doesn't sound right. In fact, uh, last week I saw data. Our student college graduates obtain a degree and come out of college with a debt of $30,000 on an average. Now think about a 21-year-old or 22-year-old young man or woman coming out of college with $30,000 debt. For me, education is all about learning. And learning, in my opinion, is an inherently a satisfying activity. Think about last time you learned something. Any time something, a light bulb goes into you, oh my God, that was awesome. Or it could be a little thing that you made, you cooked a nice dish, whatever that is. You learned something, you did something nice. You feel good about it. You are satisfied. So learning is inherently a satisfying activity. Is that what we get in schools? It doesn't sound like that. Now, I always go back to childhood. Look at children when they start walking. They don't start walk when you want to walk. They walk when they are ready. And they take their time. It is not one day they get up and start walking. It takes time for them to get up. They fall thousands of times before they stand. And then they fall thousands of times before they make their first step. And then they fall still thousands of times before they can walk. It's a process. And we adults enjoy that process. We do not go tell them, hey, let me give you some lessons on how to walk. <laughs> we don't. Now, I give this example because I feel this is a real example where kids actually learn without you teaching them. Learning occurs in the absence of teaching. But then some of my colleagues would tell me, no, you know what? Walking is not a good example because you know it's there in the animal world. It's, it's, it's in your intuition. All right, let's not talk about walking. Let's look at another skill, language. Learning a language is a very difficult process, okay? I challenge you, you decide, you pick up a language that you want to learn today and start learning. Maybe go to a community college, enroll in a class, or go to some tutoring, or sign up for an online class and see where you are three months from now or six months from now in your language skills. Now think about a child. They learn language by listening, by observing siblings, parents, and others. Sometimes these days they watch a little bit more TV too. That's new. But they learn language on their own. A five-year-old masters language on his or her own way. 
I do not know of a parent who goes to a child and says, okay, let me give you some grammar lessons today because language is a very important skill. In fact, most parents probably cannot teach grammar. So, so parents are not teaching and kids learn. Learn and master a language in two or three years. And when they make mistakes, it's fun. Think about, you know, you have in your own family little kids and when they make, pronounce the word incorrectly, you don't scold them, you actually laugh at them. <laughs> and you enjoy, you say, it's so cute. My daughter used to say the word library, we used to take her to the library for story time a couple of times a week. She would say library. And that's such a laugh, you know. I don't know when she changed from library to library, I can't remember. But she used that word library for a long time and we had a lot of fun, we laughed together. But when I used the word incorrectly or mispronounced the word knife, I was punished in grade school. I still don't know why there's a K in knife. <laughs> I still don't know, but I was punished. Nobody said it was cute. <laughs> okay? But the point here is, kids learn, master language on their own very quickly by interacting with their environment. Nobody gave them lessons, coaching, foreign language classes, all right? But what happens to them a little bit later? After five, they go to school. Now they learn the language every day in school by a qualified teacher. And they do that every single day, five times a week, 300, uh, maybe three, 36 weeks a year. 180 days of learning, and they do that every year. Now let's see what happened to the same kids in SAT and ACT and maybe in GRE. Our students do poorly even in language compared to kids from Asia. I'm not talking about math. That's a whole different story. That would need another TED talk. I'm just talking about English, the language that they mastered on their own till they are five and then they start losing that. What's going on here? Well, I know what's going on. They were learning earlier. That's what was going on. And then teaching started. And things went downhill from then onwards. So what did he got to do? Stop teaching. Start learning. Because what is happening with teaching is sacrificing learning. Teaching is all about teachers. Learning is about students. So the moment you bring the concept of teaching, the teachers become the players here. How am I going to prepare my PowerPoint slides? How am I going to present it to the students? It's all about you, not about students. All right? So you detach yourself from the students and that's what happened with teaching. In fact, I have seen one day a professor, a colleague of mine, running through the slides after slides after slides, and the class is over, and the students are not listening, and he's still going through the slide. Let me finish this. Let me finish this. Is that how you taught how to walk? Is that how we taught how to learn a language? Now, all of a sudden, you go through this complex math in a matter of a few minutes through PowerPoint presentations. What do you expect? So teaching is not learning. If teaching is learning, all what you are learning or teaching should be transferred to your head. If that happens, there will not be any failures. Every student will be an A student. If teaching is equivalent to learning, everybody would be great. There, is no, there are no failures. But that's not the case. So there is a disconnect. In fact, we try to front load students with lots of information. And that doesn't help. And information overload is not transferring knowledge. It is going to actually shut down the system. That's what happens to our students. They start texting. They start doing stuff. In fact, I found this particular slide. Take a look at this. This is from 14th century. 600 years ago, Henry of Germany, king, is on the podium. And in front of him, there are three or four rows of students. There are about 25 students, like a regular class these days. Okay? Watch the row. On the first row, they have some books, 
Some people are listening or, or, or looking at the book. Look at the third row, the guy on the... <laughs> he's totally asleep. And look at, on the second row, there is someone still falling asleep. And there are some people chatting on the back. Is it, I mean, slightly, you know, slightly change this room? It's no different from today's classroom. There's a professor or a teacher at the podium reading out a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. And there are students, some listening, some looking at the book, doing something. Replace these books with maybe some laptops and iPads and cell phones. And those chatting people probably will be Facebooking or something like that. <laughs> this classroom is no different from what was there 600 years ago. This is exactly what we are doing today with modern technology. That's about it. Okay? Students are not there. They are not engaged. And the teacher is doing what he or thinks supposed to do. That's teaching. That's why we have to stop teach. So if we have to stop teaching, how do we go back and bring that involvement of students? How do we bring back the joy of learning, the magic of learning? Well, all I know is you have to engage them. The only way we can help students learn is not by lecturing, but by engaging them. Now, that's kind of a, a loaded word. What do you mean by engaging? Well, there are some symptoms or indications for engagement. Some things that captures your attention. Like you're driving, there's an accident, you want to know what it is. Your attention is right there. That's the moment that you are ready to engage. Or you are self-motivated. Think about hobbies. It's amazing to see how many people will spend tremendous amount of time on their hobbies, which doesn't create you an income. You actually spend money on your hobbies. Probably your spouse is yelling at you for your hobby because you're putting so much time and money into your hobbies. Why? Because it gives you a certain level of satisfaction. You are motivated to do something, right? Or you are doing some hands-on activity. You are learning to drive or riding a bike. You are engaged. So there are ways how you can attract students' attention. That's one way. But how exactly you capture their attention and engage them. Now, one way that works for me, trust me, I'm an engineering professor, it works for me, so it should work for most of you, is stories. A lot of people think stories are meant for maybe history classes or maybe English classes, but stories make powerful impact on our life. I'll give you one example. When I was a kid, I always liked to listen to stories. I would tell my mom, tell me stories, tell me stories. Sometimes the same stories again and again. I don't think I was no different from any of others. Then I have my own kids. My wife would tell stories, and I would tell them occasionally stories, but I didn't have much stories. So I ran out of stories, so I'll make up stories. But then I ran out of them too. And when you make up stories, they're not that good, okay? You make it up on the spot, they are not funny. But, but anyhow, so one day I was sitting and reading a book in the afternoon. The book, some of you might have read called Swimming Across. The author of the book is Andy Grove, who was the legendary chairman of Intel. He was one of the co-founders of Intel, ran Intel for a long time, and interestingly, he, he passed away a couple of months ago. Andy Grove, everybody knows in Silicon Valley throughout the tech world. So it's his book. I was reading a lot of tech books, and Andy Grove's book I was reading Swimming Across. So my daughter comes to me, she was five or six years old. She comes to me, Dad, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading a book. And she didn't ask me, she just sat on my lap and said, what is this book about? I said, it's swimming across. Ah, huh. across what? I said, I'm reading that book, it's probably across a river. Can you tell me that story? I said, okay, I'll tell you tonight. And then I said, this is a big book, it's gonna take some time. Well, we'll do part one, part two, we'll keep going. So that night, I start telling the story of Andy Grove, who was born in Budapest, Hungary. And in 1956, when the Soviet Union uh, supported a coup in that country, he escaped Budapest by swimming across Daniel, the river Daniel. He came to America, the rest is history. I told that story over a period of few days. All my daughters listened to that story. 
Years later, much later, 15 years later, my daughter was in Europe, and she calls me from Budapest, Dad, do you know where I am? <laughs> my God, 15 years later, she's telling me she was where Andy Grove was. That's the impact of the stories that we tell to our kids. I didn't train them. I didn't teach about Intel. But there is a story about Intel I could tell. I could teach microprocessor programming with that story. You can build stories around anything. A lot of people tell me in engineering, oh, you deal with equations. In math, you deal with equations. You can't tell stories. Every equation has a story behind it. I didn't miss the whole thing. Uh, well, if you'd tell that story again, I would try to. Uh, <laughs> you were pumping your chest a little bit. Okay, all right. Okay. Anyhow, um, where was I? <laughs> uh, okay. So the, the equations, every equation has a story behind it, not just a story. It could be an, it's not an engineering story most of the time. There's an emotional story. There is jealousy, there is struggle, there is perseverance. If you talk about calculus, it's one of the most hated subjects. I have no idea why. That's, in my opinion, one of the easiest subjects to teach. But you are shaking your head, why? Because that's not how it was presented. Calculus was invented by Newton to help people to solve real problems. But we don't do that now, right? And there is a war between Leibniz and Newton, I could tell you, that you will say, I want to know that story. That could be a bedtime story, okay? So the point is, you can develop stories around it. That's one way to engage the kids. And you don't have to teach them. You have to show them. Put a little fire, fuel for inspiration. Show them to get started. That's all you need for the kids, and they will do the rest. One last thing I will add is make things easier and simpler. When you teach your kids, or when you work with your young kids, you don't go and lecture them. You don't give them complex things. Same thing. It doesn't matter what you teach or what you do in your classroom. Make it, explain it to a level of a fifth grader. Many of you would have heard about the name Richard Feynman, the renowned physicist, American physicist. He was in Manhattan Project and many other projects. If you go and ask him a question, he would say, OK, I have to present it in a way that everybody understands. So someone asked him a, big, a question, can you explain to us? He said, I'll come back and explain you in a two or three days because I had to make it simpler. A few days later, he came back and said, you know what? I don't think I understood that concept very well because I'm unable to explain it in a simple term. Richard Feynman, renowned physicist, telling that I don't think I understood the concept because I'm unable to explain it in simple terms. What are we doing? We are hiding behind equations. If you don't understand, you're not smart enough to understand. So here is what I tell when I work with my colleagues. If you cannot explain a concept that you're going to teach to your students to a fifth grader, you don't understand the concept. That's it. So I practice that. If I have to teach Newton's law to a second year engineering student, I practice it with a fifth or sixth grader. If I can't explain it to them in a simple, broad term, then I don't understand that myself. So if you, have, if you are any students here, here's what I tell you. Next time when you are in a class, if your professor tells you something you don't understand, ask them again, could you please explain? I don't get it. If they cannot explain you in a different way, in a better way that makes sense to you, trust me, they have no clue what they are talking about. <laughs> they have no clue. That's a simple testing uh, test for their knowledge, not your ignorance, all right? So there are ways to engage students. And I believe as educators, if we stop teaching the way we have been doing and turn around and start helping students to learn, we'll be better off. And, and it's not that hard. We just have to figure out a way to engage students and bring back the magic of learning. Thank you. <laughs>